Hey guys, the Explorer of Horror here, Horrorboy465, finally getting back to YouTube, and I figured that since I had taken a little bit of time off that I should make my comeback uh, quite surprising and quite a big deal. So, out of all the franchises that I've chosen to review, um, this one is very interesting in particular because this is one that I have absolutely not covered before. Um, this is one that I've mentioned before. Um, because I have seen the fourth film in the past, uh, for the longest time that was the only one that I did see, and uh, yes, I will rewatch that movie when it gets to that review, but um, today I'm actually getting to um, a pretty awesome franchise that uh, I'm honestly a pretty big fan of right now, and I've only seen three uh, out of the five movies, and that is the Phantasm franchise. Um... This is a franchise that I've always wanted to do a review for. I've always wanted to cover this series because um, this movie, along with Nightmare on Elm Street, is kind of... It's not that this movie is as big as an influence as Nightmare, because with this movie, I remember seeing it a long time ago. I was probably about six or seven when I seen this movie. I was way too young. But I wanted to check it out. I was like, oh, what's this movie? And, you know, and I want to check out Nightmare on Elm Street as well. And um, they even warned me. that was like, you know, there's pretty scary movies. So I was like, well, no, I want to see this one. Because I've seen, like, I think the cover of the, it was a VHS. So I think the cover of the VHS had the sphere on it. And I was like, oh, cool, I want to see it. It looks really awesome. So I ended up watching Phantasm 1. And it scared the crap out of me. Um, and for the longest time, I really couldn't remember what scared me about it. It was just watching it. And I think it was the moment when uh, the character Mike, uh, he cuts the tall man's fingers off. Which I'll talk about that a little bit more in depth when I get further into the review. But I think it's the moment where he chops his fingers off. That really just made me go, oh, whoa, what the... Because if, even if you watch the scene nowadays, it's just a very kind of out of nowhere, unexpected type of scene. Um, and I thought that it just it worked really good when I was a, when I was a kid. It definitely scared the crap out of me. So I watched this, and then I watched Nightmare on Elm Street, and that scared the crap out of me too. It actually made me run out of the room. I didn't want to watch horror movies anymore. And then began my love for horror. So Phantasm, even though it wasn't as big as an influence as Nightmare on Elm Street, because I could actually, I could remember that movie a little bit more, and that movie, you know, is kind of made for, I don't know how more else to say this, but like a mainstreamer type audience. Um, so yeah, from there on, um, I've been a big horror fan. Um, I remember after I seen those two movies, I was just like, man, you know, why don't I get out there and kind of explore this a little bit, because there was something that kind of drew me uh, to horror film in particular. Um, and that's pretty much where me and Phantasm kind of have that history. And my chair just uh, kind of, I don't know if it broke, but uh, kind of just, I don't know. We're going to continue on from that. That scared the crap out of me. Jump scare right in the middle of the video. I don't know if I'm going to keep that in or not. I might just be lazy and keep that in, but that scared the crap out of me. Um, but yeah, uh, Phantasm has always been a series that I've wanted to cover. Um, the problem was, before this DVD was released, there was no easy way to find Phantasm. Um, I'd say probably the easiest way, maybe, was the VHS, because the DVD was very rare to find. Um, the sequels were even harder to find, except for Phantasm 2. I remember Phantasm 2 being pretty common. But tracking down the first movie, you know, was a big pain. Um, I found the fourth movie for a pretty good deal. I think I picked it up for like 15 bucks, which it's usually around 45 to 50 bucks, I think, last time I checked. Um, the third one is extremely rare. That was around like $300 when I checked back then. Um, and the fifth one didn't come out yet when I, you know, watched Phantasm 4. So I picked up Phantasm 4. I watched that. Um, disappointed with it. But I'll get back to it with these reviews because... Surprisingly, Phantasm 4 actually does have a pretty big following, so I'll re-watch it and give it another chance, but um, where it stands with me right now, I'm not really a big fan of Phantasm 4. And then I seen Phantasm 2, and I kind of got where the series was going, but I didn't get the full picture. And now that I've kind of watched Phantasm 1 and 2 um, in order, it's making like a lot more sense than usual, than it did before actually. Um, 
And today, we're going to be talking about the original 1979 film, Phantasm, which is remastered beautifully. Um, it has some pretty decent features. I think Phantasm 2 tops it, but this has still got some really great features to it. Um, I think it has um, like a panel. It might have had a panel. Let me check real quick. I think it has a panel. It has a commentary. has um, – uh, sorry, guys. I'm trying to read this real quick. Uh, Graveyard Cars episode. Interviews with 1979 Don, Don Coscarelli and Angus Scrim, Deleted scenes and trailers. So it does have features. Um, and the original Phantasm, like I said, it was just a movie that when I was a kid – um, I think the reason why I didn't remember this movie as much is because this is more of a slower type of, you know, methodical type horror film where you're, you're, you're not really shown the full picture immediately. And even though you watch the movie all the way through, you're kind of wondering, you know, what happened is what was real, what wasn't real. It's kind of a mind games movie. So I think as a young kid around six or seven years old, it was hard for me to sit down and watch a movie like this. It was like... It would be like me trying to sit down and watch A Clockwork Orange or The Shining. You know, it just probably wouldn't work that well because that's more of a movie that you're supposed to watch, you know, when you get used to movies like that. So rewatching this movie again was pretty amazing. First of all, I want to say it does have some pretty good features on it. It has a commentary. It has some interviews on it from back in the 70s. Um, it has deleted scenes, which I think there's a lot of deleted footage from this movie. Um, it looks great. It sounds great. Um, definitely a good pickup. Um, I'm kind of sad they don't really have a Blu-ray collection. They might. I'm not sure. But this is still a great transfer. I know this is on Blu-ray, but this is still great. And Phantasm 1, I have to say, is, is after watching it again, it's definitely one of my favorite horror films out there. Um, it's just a movie that, even though you look at it and it's from the 70s, you know, it's kind of like Halloween where and, and you know, Chainsaw Massacre and um, a couple of other films I've seen in the 70s. Like, uh, you know, it's somewhat Last House on the Left and then the other ways it kind of has aged, you know, maybe the music and the goofy, silly segments. But there's still some stuff in, in Last House on the Left that does not age. Um, you know, those really serious type gritty, you know, horror films like I Spit in Your Grave definitely do stick with time very well because it's a very realistic approach to, you know, that whole thing the, uh, where it's, you know, rape and revenge and stuff. But this one kind of reminds me of Halloween where it does things so well, film-wise, score-wise, um, tone-wise, character-wise, you know, acting. Really, everything in this movie is no. I think that's what makes this movie... A very solid horror film. I think the budget for this movie was very low budget. I know it was extremely low budget. Came out like 79, like I said before, gets 6.8 on IMDb. It needs to be way higher than that. If I would rate it, I'd give it an 8.0 on IMDb. That's just how much I love it. But I know it had like very little money. $300,000. It grossed out about 11 million, so it definitely was a pretty successful film. And it was, it was enough success that they wanted to get a sequel made for it, which Don, Don Coscarelli wanted to kind of wait on. He kind of wanted to take his time with uh, the sequels. Um, and it's, it's evident because you have Phantasm 2 and 88, Phantasm 3 and 94, Phantasm uh, 4 and 98, and Phantasm 5 in, in 2016. So Don Coscarelli does take his time with these sequels, and it does help because Phantasm 2 is great. Phantasm 4, I'll have to rewatch, but so far, the second movie was, like, really good. So, um, they had very little money with the movie. Um, I know that most of the effects were kind of just done, you know, I don't even think they had an effects team. They just kind of made it on the spot, which really surprised me because there's some fantastic makeup effects in this film. Um, and I know that Don Coscarelli, you know... Um, thinks that, you know, maybe it's not with really Don Coscarelli, but I know that people have mentioned that, you know, the effects have kind of aged and that you can tell that it's, you know, kind of a homemade effect or whatever. I can. I don't know 
how people think that I personally don't get that for me these effects are perfect they're they're great um, I can't really think of an effect that looked fake honestly most of them look pretty legitimate um, even the bug scene where you have that crazy creepy bug that you know crawls up Mike's head you know that scene was definitely very well done so I don't get that I don't get it people say the effects are uh, aged I'm not really too sure to think about that I mean I personally don't see it and the story is very very classic where you have the small town um, the movie opens up with this guidance girl uh, you know doing the dirty deed and you do get to see uh, boobies in like the first opening of the movie so if you're looking for that you got that in there but the movie opens up with that and then you find that the girl who this guy is making out with and you know is getting ready to do it with is a tall man and kills and stabs the guy and the movie kind of opens up like that we cut to characters named uh, Mike, uh, Jody, and Reggie um, they're three best friends uh, Jody is Mike's brother and um, they were all three friends to the guy who got killed and Mike starts to notice that the Undertaker type character or the coroner um, is you know definitely very suspicious very creepy you know he's picking up a coffin by himself he's acting very suspicious and Mike starts to investigate this and you know meanwhile he knows these people are kind of spiritual so he goes there and you know they're trying to tell him you know his future and you know what's gonna happen and pretty much Mike gets more and more involved with trying to figure out what's going on with this person this tall man and eventually you know leads to where he goes to this uh, funeral or um, sort of the building I don't know why I can't think of it right now but he goes to the building where the tall man's at um, and while he's in there, he sees kind of one of his bodyguards. You know, he's walking through. And I, I love how the inside of this, uh, I don't know, mortuary, I think that's the word for it. But I know I'm stupid. I can't remember the word right now. But he's walking to the mortuary, and it's just – this movie does this very well where he's walking through, and you have that, that sound effect. The I swear, through the years and years to come, will never age. That kind of background high-pitched noise that just is significant with Phantasm. If you've seen Phantasm and you know what I'm talking about, um, just that sound, that like kind of alien-like sound, that I swear will never age. That sound is like timeless, and it will always be, you know, signified with the Phantasm films. And um, you just have, you know, my favorite set design from, you know, the whole series as far as mortuaries go. Phantasm 2 did it very well. Phantasm 4, I can't really remember that well, the mortuary design. But this one is definitely the best one where it's like it's pristine, it's clean, it's bright. There's like marble walls and it looks beautiful, but it looks creepy. There's like artwork, creepy artwork. Very basic, but very special to the movie i thought that it, that won't age as well and this the idea of these spheres will never age and the idea of the tall man and that's what helps this movie is that it's not it doesn't tie in totally to the 70s you know that's a big reason why chainsaw massacre won't age why halloween won't age why jaw jaws won't age um why this won't age and why a lot of other horror films that are from the 70s haven't aged a lot because, you know, using elements like this, you know, this awesome idea of having these spheres, which I think there's only one in this movie, but that's cool enough, where it goes into the guy's head, um, the tall man's servant's head, and yeah, that great scene where it just dr drills into his head, and I remember being a kid. And seeing that happen where it drills in, it squirts the blood out, and it's practical. It's all practical. And it looks great. Hasn't aged a bit in my opinion. But he's like holding it, it's like squirting out blood, he falls on the ground. You even see him, because in, you know, in real life, if you die, your body cleans out all of its systems. So 
when he dies, he, you know, urinates on the floor. And then that was a big deal when this movie came out, like, you know, kind of a realistic kind of death where his bodily fluids get flushed out. And I know that that got the movie in some heat, and I think all the foreign cuts had that pretty much removed. Um, but they could keep everything else in the movie, but that was removed because I think it was just, you know, too realistic to real-life death or something like that. But they got in trouble for that. Um... And it's just a great, iconic scene. You know, you think of Phantasm, you think of that moment where a, the sphere goes into the guy's head and drills in and squirts out blood. It's just, like, one of the most classic scenes in horror film history. I know that it was also uh, featured in uh, the DVD Boogeyman, the Killer Compilation. It was in that as well. But it's a classic scene. There's a lot of scenes that just are pitch perfect for this movie. So you have that happen where it squirts out yellow and green and uh, not green, but yellow and uh, like pus mixed with blood. It's very, it's it's very weird. It's a very crazy scene. And then you know, tall man chases Mike. Uh, Mike has that scene where he shuts tall man's hand in the door and chops his fingers off. To me, that hasn't aged. You have the great scene where Mike has the finger in the box and the fingers are moving. looks great. And that's what I mean. If they didn't really have an effects team in this movie, they did, like, a great job. They pretty much became effects men because these effects are great. Um, and you have, you know, the scene where the finger is turned to the bug and it flies around. It's, to me, it just it kind of looked creepy just the way that it, it was designed. I know it's like, oh, well, it's just a bug, and it was probably on a wire, but it was a good effect. It looked creepy. I thought it worked well, um, and they pretty much put it in this garbage disposal, and, you know, it escapes, and they got to deal with it again, and they, you know, they put it back in the garbage disposal, and that's when Reggie kind of finds out what's going on, and, you know, these characters, you know, before I get too further, these characters are very memorable. I mean, Reggie, the ice cream man who becomes... Sort of this badass out of nowhere. Uh, Mike, there's a good protagonist for the for the franchise, a good leader. He's a good lead actor. Um, I think it's A. Michael Baldwin, who was in three, he was in four, and he was in, I think he's in five. He wasn't in two because he got replaced by James Lee Gross, who I thought did a great job as Mike, but... You know, A. Michael Baldwin is definitely my favorite version of Mike because in this movie, he's just a kid trying to stop this. He's trying his best to stop whatever the tall man is doing, trying to figure this out, you know. So he's a good lead character. And, you know, you have Jody, Bill Thornberry, um, plays Jody, uh, Mike's older brother, does a great job, you know, kind of wanting to escape whatever he's trapped in and kind of wanting to get out in the world and kind of experience things on his own. You know, definitely a very relatable character. You know, you can definitely put yourself in his shoes. And it's little moments like the guitar scene where Jody and Reggie are playing the guitar or the ending scene where, you know, Reggie's by the fire with the guitar and he's talking to Mike. And, you know, you have that those character moments that really flesh these characters out because they could have been just generic, oh, Mike, Reggie, and Jody. But it was not, it was, you could feel the chemistry there. You know, they were friends. Uh, Jody was Mike's brother. He tried to help, you know, he tried his best, and so did Mike. And you had that great scene where at the end of the movie where they worked together to kind of put Tall Man in this endless kind of abyss, or this endless pit, kind of trap him there because they know that they probably can't kill him or whatever. But, you know, you have those scenes that are very well done, and... As the movie plays along, you got some more stuff going on. I mean, they get pretty much all of them get geared up. They get shotguns and pistols and stuff. They go to the mortuary. Um, they deal with these like little minion dwarfs that kind of work for the tall man. Creepy. I don't know why, but these ideas on paper, like you're like dwarfs, really flying spheres that have knives and you know oozy kind of. Pussy blood and aliens and dimensions. You're looking at it and it's like, could this really be taken seriously? And Don Coscarelli made it to where you take it seriously. It is a legit, serious, scary movie. It is creepy at times. Very creepy. And 
they get to the mortuary and they deal with the little dwarf creatures and they're shooting them and some great effects and they find out that the tall man is pretty much this like alien type creature who shrinks people down and sends them off to this other dimension to kind of be his slaves in a way, kind of be his his worshippers or his minions or whatever. And you had that scene where Mike falls in and you have where it's all red. And I think it looks the best in this movie. They did it in the sequel, but I think it looks great in this movie how they did it. I don't know how they did the effect, but it looks legitimately like he went into a different dimension. It looks legitimately good. Um, and I don't know if the remastered portion of the DVD kind of helped with that, but it, it looks great. It looks like it hasn't aged a bit. And you have Mike sort of in midair looking down at like all these minions and they're like carrying these little um, compartments that have other minions in them so they can get more people on the dimension. And you had that part where Jody pulls them out and, you know, they fight the tall man for a little bit. Um, they get out of there. Reggie gets stabbed. Um, you think one thing is going on where Jody is trying to maybe lure the tall man over here and have him fall down. And maybe that's how you would solve it. And the movie kind of plays with that. And then this is where the kind of the, you know, the signature kind of confusion for the Phantasm series where you think one thing's going on, but it's actually another. It's a mind games movie. It really is. And when you get to the end of it, you think that's pretty much it. They win. But no, you find out that it pretty much was all a dream. That Jody was killed in a car crash and that Mike was, you know... Dreaming it all up, the tall man didn't do it. And you have the ending shot where a tall man's still alive and he looks and that classic line, boy, and kind of just breaks through the mirror, these arms they break through the mirror and you know drag Mike in and the movie ends. It's a very classic movie, and there's a lot of great scenes. Like I love the way this scene looks. And I don't know if I can find a picture of it. There's not really any pictures in the DVD. But I love how it looks. It's on the poster. Where Mike is sleeping, and he wakes, he's, he's kind of in this dream world, and you ha he wakes up in this graveyard, and there's caskets all around him, and you have that creepy kind of, I guess, mannequin. It's not like a mannequin, but you can kind of tell it's a mannequin, but in this instance, it looks creepy, because it's the tall man hovering over Mike, but the way that it looks is just creepy. It could look, it could have been silly. You know, making a, a doll, or not a doll, but like a mascot. Not, I keep saying the wrong thing. But, you know, you're making it to where it's fake, and it's not really Angus Grimm. Or maybe it could be, but, you know, you're kind of wondering what's going on there. And Tallman's just kind of hovering over Mike. And it just the shot looks creepy. And then these zombies come out and grab him, and he wakes up. There's a great scene where Jody is sitting down. And these zombies kind of break out of the wall and grab them. Those scenes are done extremely well. And the movie has a great tone to it. You know, at points it can be beautiful. It can be great to look at. At points it can be really creepy and disturbing. You know, it plays mind games. Psychological type of movie. And there's a lot of great stuff to it. The spheres, the tall man, the characters. Uh, the effects have not aged at all in my opinion. The music is fantastic. You have things in this movie that are so iconic, like the killer spheres, um, the idea of the tall man being this alien creature kind of, you know, breaks these people down and sends them off to a planet, you know, just really original stuff in this movie. And Phantasm is definitely my favorite one so far. Part two is a really good sequel, but, you know, my first one is definitely the, my favorite one is definitely the first one. Um... So yeah, I don't know what else I can say about Phantasm though. It's it's a movie that if you haven't seen, go check out. It's a really good horror film. It's creepy, it's scary, it's serious. It does a great job. Um, Don Coscarelli, big fan Don Coscarelli, did a great job with this movie and the series. Made a great franchise. And uh, it's a classic horror film. That definitely, I thought, suited the return of Horror Boy 465. So anyways, guys, thanks for watching my review on Phantasm the Original, and uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow with my review of Phantasm 2, The Ball's Back. 
Anyways, guys, thanks for watching the video. Hope you guys enjoyed. I am so sorry for being gone for so long. Um, just had to take some time off and kind of get re-energized and, you know, get everything, you know, back in order again. And it's great to be back here on YouTube. I hope you guys enjoyed, and I'll see you guys soon. The Explorer of Horror is out.